Probably most of us have brought something at some time from a boots shop. But how did the story begin? Well, it all starts with John Boot, who was an agricultural labourer in South Nottinghamshire. He moved into the town in Victorian times. There he met Mary Mills, the daughter of a lace bookkeeper. To make a living, he decided to open a tiny little herbal shop at the bottom of Goosegate. This ran parallel to Woolpack Lane. The shop did reasonably well, but tragically John Boot died when Jesse was only 10 years old. So what was to happen? Well, Mary said that Jesse should carry on with his education and he carried on at school until he was 13. Then he helped his mother with the shop. When he was 21, Mary said, well, now you're of age, you can carry on with the shop or you can go into another business. It's up to you. He said, well, yes, I'll like to carry on with the shop. And goodness, he certainly carried on with the shop. When he had enough money and he had to get this considerable bank loan, he decided to move further up Goosegate because three adjacent properties had come up for sale. He snapped them all up together and then he got a local architect, Richard Sutton, to knock these properties into one shop. He had put in plate glass windows, there were barley sugar iron columns. It was very imposing, particularly for a chemist shop, and it did very well. It soon became the talk of the town. And soon his eyes were set on expansion and his opening shops on Arkwright Street, Mansfield Road, even in Sheffield and Lincoln. But probably because of overwork, he had a complete mental and physical breakdown. His sister Jane advised him to go to Jersey because it had a warm climate. He may have said no, but eventually she persuaded him to go. He had developing rheumatoid arthritis and she probably mentioned Jersey because of the warm climate being good for arthritic conditions. And while he was there, he met somebody, a certain young lady, Florence Shaw. She was the daughter of St Helia Station and when they met he was impressed because she knew all about shopkeeping and, and business. It was also love at first sight. Later they married and they lived in those early years above the shop on Goosegate. But Florence was always very much a part of the company's development right from those early times. In the 1890s Jesse opened a different sort of shop on the corner of Pelham Street and High Street, right in the town centre, very good location. And it had lots of arc lamps so that the ladies could do shopping well into winter's evening and lots of different sections. And the, some of these sections were actually developed by Florence. There were sections for perfumeries, you could buy pictures that she uh, had selected and thought would do well, which indeed they, they did. She opened book lovers' libraries in Pelham Street and elsewhere, and cafes. These were all her ideas, and she controlled them and managed them, and they all did very, very well. So the Pelham Street store was a kind of department store, a different kind of shop completely. And it, when it was restarted in 1903, Jesse selected Albert Nelson Bromley to do the restyling. Some of it was also done by another of his architects who was Morley Horder. So this was a very significant development. The company continued to expand beyond the 1900s and by 1914, the outbreak of World War I, Boots had 560 branches and a turnover of two and a half million pounds. With the war, of course, a lot of normal sales declined, but the government asked Jesse to produce chemicals, vermin powder, iodine in huge quantities, lots of things that would be needed for nursing stations and for troops on the front line. This he did, but it took a toll on his own health. Never perhaps a, a well man. Uh, after the war, then he was extremely uh, unhealthy, he was in a poor condition with his arthritis. And at that point, he decided to sell the company, the Boots Company, to Louis Liggett, who was the head of Rexhall's, a giant American drugs company. 
people may have tried to persuade him otherwise, but once he'd made his mind up, that was it. And of course, he had a few bob in his pocket to spend. And that's when his philanthropic side emerged to the full. And so he was giving money to the general hospital, many charities. But also along came a huge project that really caught his eye. And this was to develop a new university complex, new buildings for University College Nottingham. It was on a very cramped site in, in town and it needed somewhere to expand to and to develop to become a full university. Jesse had brought 35 acres at a place called Highfields on the edge of the town and land that bordered with Beeston Parish. Perhaps he was thinking of a sort of Cadbury's Bourneville or Leavers Port Sunlight, but that wasn't to happen. But of course, this was perfect for a new university site. One of his main architects, Morley Horder, actually designed for him Trent Building, the first significant building on the site that overlooks the, the boating lake, which people may well walk past or students may uh, enjoy all the facilities at, at Highfields and the public today. And so Jesse became very busy with that. But in the meantime, his son, John Boot, had actually, during the Depression, brought up the majority shareholdings of the Boots company and brought it back into English hands with him, the head of the company. Jesse Boot died in 1931, but his son John carried on, of course, with the business and he became vice chancellor eventually of the new university. He also managed the introduction of lots of new products such as the Boots Number no. 7 range which came in in, 1830, in in 1935 and this was hugely popular and successful and is still in shops today. And the Boots name continues, it's very much on all our lips, very much a household name on the high street and, and beyond. But the story began with the Boots family, John Boot and then Jesse Boot and, and Florence, very much a family story in those early days.